Here in America, we've got this large array of radio telescopes pointed up at the sky, and they're listening for any sign of intelligent life because something tells us we can't possibly just be alone in this universe. I mean, not with all the amazing variety that seems to be out there above our heads. You know, we've now estimated something like 100 billion galaxies, the ones that we can see. And each of those galaxies has something like 100 billion star systems in it. So with that much real estate in the cosmos, what are the odds that we're actually alone down here? But it's not really the question of what's out there that fascinates me so much as why do we care if there's something out there? Why in the world would we waste even a single minute worrying about this stuff? The famous science fiction writer Arthur C. Clarke, you know, the guy who wrote 2001 A Space Odyssey, he once said two possibilities exist. Either we are alone in the universe or we are not. Both are equally terrifying. And I guess that, that quote started me thinking, why in the world should we care? Why should it bother us if we discover that the universe is just a big empty space and there's absolutely nobody else out there? I mean, on a day-to-day -day basis, the possibility that there is something out there has, well, it has no bearing on my life. Yesterday happened without any contact from the ETs, just like the thousand days that came before it. And presumably, today is going to end exactly the same way. No contact from the aliens. And that's probably the way it's going to go the rest of your life. So what difference does it make whether or not they exist? And then why is it that when you and I look up at the night sky, something happens in here in our hearts? We, we get this feeling like there's supposed to be something out there. Like maybe something out there is actually looking back at us. Where does that feeling come from? I mean, from an evolutionary perspective, that, that doesn't really make sense. Because under the evolutionary paradigm, all you really need to do is develop the talents you need to just exist in this life. You don't need to become curious. You just need to eat and drink and find shelter and reproduce. But there's nothing, nothing in the evolutionary scheme that should make you think about things like the future or make you think about whether or not there's intelligent life on another planet out there sitting around wondering the same kinds of things that we wonder about. You don't need that stuff under the evolutionary scheme because none of that helps you survive. But if we were put here for a reason, if the human race is here on Earth deliberately, on purpose, then these questions really do start to matter. You know, years ago, I, I lived on the Alaska Highway, which if you've ever been there, you know it's a pretty desolate place. I mean, desolate in the sense that you can drive for hours and hours and never see another human being. But that isolation never really bothered me because, well, I've always had a thing for being alone and especially being alone in the wilderness. I love finding places where the next human being is hundreds of miles away. And so I kind of liked living there. And that place gives you space to think. It gives you a bit of relief from the constant press of humanity. And one of the big attractions up there in the middle of nowhere was Aurora Borealis, the Northern Lights, which you could see, well, on a pretty regular basis every single winter. There would be days going by where you saw it every single night. And even though it was often 30 or 40 below, I would pull my car over to the side of the road and go out and lie down in a snowbank just to look up into the sky and witness this miracle of light. And of course, you know, the northern lights are aesthetically satisfying. They're spectacular, more than you might suspect if you've never actually seen them in person. But I've got to tell you, it wasn't just the beauty that would keep me there in sub-zero temperatures on my back, staring up into the sky. It was something else. It was more that sense of awe you get when you look up into the universe and begin to think about where we are. I mean, the human race sits perched on the outer edges of a minor galaxy, and it's just one out of billions and billions and billions of galaxies. And when you think about it, 
you suddenly realize just how small you and I are. It's, it's like that photograph of the Earth taken by Voyager 1 back in 1990 when it was 3.7 billion miles from Earth. It took a picture of us. And in the picture, this Earth is just a pale blue dot, nothing more than a pixel in a very giant photo. And it's invisible if you don't know to look for it. So I look at that and then I think, I'm just a microscopic dot on that microscopic dot. I am one of seven billion people. And you'd think that if you and I were nothing but an accident, life forms that just evolved by accident just to survive, then you'd think we wouldn't have the brain capacity to think about these kinds of things. I mean, why should we care? that the universe is massive and by comparison I'm nothing. Where would that sense of awe come from? It doesn't make a whole lot of sense. And yet it's such a profound and common experience that we have ancient records of people wondering the very same kinds of things. We've been thinking about these questions for a long, long time. I mean, just have a look at the ancient book of Psalms which was composed and assembled some 3,000 years ago, and parts of it is, are even older than that. In the book of Psalms, you find one of the most eloquent descriptions that I've ever read. So let me read this to you. And, and this is really one of the better known passages in the whole of the Bible. This is a poet speaking to the Creator. Here's what he says in Psalm 8 and verse 3. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and stars which you have ordained, what is man that you are mindful of him, and the son of man that you visit him? For you have made him a little lower than the angels, and you have crowned him with glory and honor." Now, there's quite a bit more to the poem, but I want you to notice how the author recognizes two contrary thoughts at the same time. On the one hand, he looks up at the universe and realizes that personally, he amounts to nothing. He's just this insignificant speck compared to the vastness of the universe, which makes him think that God couldn't possibly be interested in somebody as small as him. But then at the same time, he recognizes that somehow the human race is important because the God of the universe has showered us with attention. Now, I don't know who you are. Maybe you believe in God, maybe you don't. But you've got to admit that the human race seems to enter this world hardwired with a sense that somehow we have got to be important. And for the longest time, we even believed that we were living in the geographical center of the universe with the sun and everything else revolving around us. It just seemed so obvious to us that we're the point of the universe. But then we discovered that we really aren't the center of anything. I mean, not even our own galaxy or solar system. But still to this day, we, we can't help that sense that somehow, in some way, we must still be the center of attention because somebody out there appears to be paying attention to us. And for the life of me, I, 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 again, I can't think of a single evolutionary reason any of that might be true. I mean, other than the possibility that maybe many years ago, we kind of figured out that living in community enhanced our chances for survival and so we began to think that the human community was all important. But even that would take careful and complex thinking, the kind of thinking that also can contemplate the future, the kind of thinking that considers complex relationships and then works those relationships out to our own advantage. Now, all of that might happen by accident, but to me it looks more like somebody designed us the way we are on purpose. So, so let's go back to that statement by Arthur Clarke because, well, it gives me a lot to think about. Why in the world would he find it terrifying to think that we're alone? And, and you know he thought about this kind of stuff a lot because his signature work, 2001, A Space Odyssey, centers around the idea that alien cultures have interacted with our planet at some point in the past of human history. And judging by that movie's popularity, he tapped into something very essential in the human spirit, something important in all of us. So, why would it be terrifying to consider the thought that maybe you and I are alone in the universe? Now, of course, I, 
I can't go ask Mr. Clark what he meant because he died back in 2008, but still I don't think it's that hard to figure out what was going on. In order for you and I to figure out exactly who we are and to understand why we might be here, you really need somebody else external to the picture. Because, because you see, you and I live in this ecological system that supports life. And we've managed to go a long way towards understanding how things work. But what we don't understand is why it's here. So right now, I'm going to take a quick break and I'll be right back to think about that thought just a little bit more. Life can throw a lot at us. Sometimes we don't have all the answers. But that's where the Bible comes in. It's our guide to a more fulfilling life. Here at The Voice of Prophecy, we've created the Discover Bible Guides to be your guide to the Bible. They're designed to be simple, easy to use, and provide answers to many of life's toughest questions. And they're absolutely free. So jump online now or give us a call and start your journey of discovery. Welcome back. Look, here's what I guess I'm driving at today. And, and I think I'm going to borrow from a book by Rabbi Jonathan Sachs he released back in 2011. He, he attempts to describe our need for both science and religion at the same time. And I'm going to quote this at length because it's really pretty good. So here comes a little bit of reading theater. But why, he writes, would a being independent of the universe wish to bring the universe into being? There is only one compelling answer. Out of the selfless desire to make space for otherness, that for want of a better word, we call love. Such a being would create precisely the kind of universe we inhabit, one that gave rise to stars, planets, life in endless proliferating diversity, and eventually the one life form capable of hearing and responding to the call of being itself. The existence of the universe from the perspective of God and the existence of God from the perspective of human beings is the redemption of solitude. We exist because we are not alone. Religion is the cosmic drama of relationship. Now, there's a lot in that statement, but let me share just one thought that I think proves to be really important, at least from my perspective. If you and I are really alone in the universe, then there is no meaning to life. We just happen to emerge from a random process of chemical events after billions and billions of years. Here we are, human race. And if there's nothing else out there, then you and I are meaningless. There is no reason we exist. And not only will you die in the next few decades, but eventually the whole human race, including this planet and the solar system, just going to disappear the day the sun burns out. And there won't even be somebody left behind to remember that you and I were ever here. And I, I guess the fact that that idea is so unsettling, well, it tells me that there's something wrong with that thinking. Eventually, if you become consumed by this, it just drives you to despair, to the point of thinking that maybe a few short years of suffering on planet Earth probably isn't worth it. I mean, that's the question that the nihilist philosopher Albert Camus labored with so deeply. In his famous book, The Myth of Sisyphus, he struggled with the meaning of life and he ultimately came to the conclusion that life doesn't mean anything, that any attempt to find meaning is just a waste of time. So the ultimate question for Camus is, why not just commit suicide? I mean, why bother with this life? Why put up with the suffering? If you're just going to disappear anyway and none of this means anything. Now, fortunately, Albert Camus still somehow came to the conclusion that life is worth living. And I'm, I'm glad for that because I happen to think it is. But still, he raises a really good point. The fact that our most profound need is purpose and meaning. So here we are, floating around in this vast universe, part of what appears to be a carefully designed system, and all of us want it to mean something. The problem, though, is this. If the universe just popped into existence, and you and I could go looking for meaning and purpose inside that same accidental universe, then whatever you find there is also going to be an accident. And even then, it still means nothing. But if there is something else outside of the visible universe, then you suddenly have this reference point you can use to judge the meaning of the universe. Because, well, you need something 
from outside the system to be able to define it. Let me see if I can illustrate this from the, the example of marriage and sexuality. We can see that human sexuality is very important from a purely practical point of view. I mean, this is how the human race perpetuates itself. This is how the next generation comes into existence. It's a part of the system. And from that perspective, human beings are really no different than mushrooms because they also reproduce. But you and I both know that human beings are not like mushrooms. And the act of reproducing for us is far more than just biology. Ideally, you and I try to find a mate for life, someone you cling to even after your kids grow up and leave. And if you raised a family, you, you know that living with a family comes with a lot of emotional entanglements. Human beings keep their offspring close to them for something like two decades, far longer, by the way, than most other species. And there is no science that really explains the emotions that come with raising a child or with choosing a mate or with the satisfaction that comes from a lifetime of learning to live together. Now, science might be able to explain how the human race reproduces, but it takes something outside of the mechanical systems of biology to explain why marriage means so much to us. That's kind of why I say meaning comes from the outside. Meaning is something that a thinking mind imposes on physical reality. And it's almost impossible to explain the concept of meaning with just numbers and charts and graphs. So now let's apply that to the idea of our existence. If everything is an accident and there's nothing else out there, then all we are is machines. And the idea that you and I have meaning, that's just an illusion, an accidental part of an accidental system. But then put somebody else out there, outside the system, a thinking, sentient being. And that thinking, sentient being is the reason you exist. Well, then suddenly, with that thinking, your life does have meaning because someone created you on purpose. And the very fact that you and I exist is because we are not alone. And then, suddenly, that overwhelming sense of longing you get when you look up at the night sky, it begins to make perfect sense. This is not just a matter of scientific curiosity. This is you looking for somebody else. You might just be searching for home. Something has been telling you your whole life that mere biology is not enough of an explanation. Coming from nothing isn't enough. Something is telling you you have deeper origins. And one of the things you're supposed to do with this lifetime before you die is figure out where you came from and why you exist. And if the God of the Bible is real, and I've got to say, well over 90% of us around the world believe that He's out there in some form. If, if God is real, then He is the answer to your existence. Or as Rabbi Sachs put it, maybe God is the question to which our lives are the answer. I'll be right back after this. Here at The Voice of Prophecy, we're committed to creating top quality programming for the whole family, like our audio adventure series, Discovery Mountain. Discovery Mountain is a Bible-based program for kids of all ages and backgrounds. Your family will enjoy the faith-building stories from this small mountain summer camp and town. With 24 seasonal episodes every year and fresh content every week, there's always a new adventure just on the horizon. Welcome back. Let's ask this question. Why is it that a loss of a sense of purpose appears to be a death sentence for most human beings? I forget exactly where I read this, but years ago, I remember reading that men who retire and they don't find some new purpose in life, some new reason to get out of bed every morning, they last an average of 18 months, and then they die. It's almost as if human life becomes impossible if human life doesn't have purpose. And you'll notice that does not appear to be true for lower forms of life. I mean, think about the banana slug of the Pacific Northwest. It appears to get on with its daily existence just fine. And I could be wrong, but somehow I doubt that slug is oozing around on the forest floor contemplating the meaning of his existence. Yet you and I do that. There's got to be a reason for that. One of the most 
famous books on the meaning of life was written by Viktor Frankl in the wake of the German death camps of World War II. All of the prisoners, in his experience, were stripped down to absolutely nothing, even to the point of having their hair shaved off. And, and that wasn't just for lice control, he says. They were being deliberately dehumanized, stripped of all meaning. And at one point, Frankel says this, The prisoner who had lost faith in the future, his future was doomed. With his loss of belief in the future, he also lost his spiritual hold. He let himself decline and became subject to mental and physical decay. Usually, this happened quite suddenly, in the form of a crisis, the symptoms of which were familiar to the experienced camp inmate. We all feared this moment, not for ourselves, which could have been pointless, but for our friends. Usually, it began with the prisoner refusing one morning to get dressed and wash or go out on the parade grounds. No entreaties, no blows, no threats had any effect. He just lay there, hardly moving. If this crisis was brought about by an illness, he refused to be taken to the sick bay or do anything to help himself. He simply gave up. Now, try to explain that from a purely rational standpoint, and you're going to find it difficult, if not impossible. For some reason, you and I have to have purpose, a reason to live. And that reason has to be something outside of ourselves. So in that light, the thought of being alone in this universe is not only terrifying, it's absolutely deadly. It actually makes us something less than human. But if God does exist, apart from this creation, apart from this universe, and if He says you and I were made on purpose, well, that changes everything. Suddenly, we are more than machines. We are more than chemical processes. And our lives become pregnant with meaning. Now, of course, what Arthur C. Clarke was talking about was alien civilizations. That, that's a different ballgame. I, and I, I would suggest that if such things do exist, then chances are those distant aliens haven't got a clue we're here, and they can't possibly give us meaning or purpose. But God's a different story. Because what we know about God is that He made us in His image. You and I were born because we mean something to Him. And the greatest intelligence in the universe, or rather the greatest intelligence above the universe, he says my existence counts for something. So let's go back and read that psalm one more time, but let's just look at it a little deeper. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and stars which you have ordained, what is man that you are mindful of him and the son of man that you visit him? Now. I, I know that just about every culture has its ancient stories and myths, but the God described in the Bible has a unique characteristic that's worth thinking about. Most religions have us trying to climb up to something bigger than ourselves. The gods of ancient mythology kind of treated the human race like a nuisance. But the God of the Bible makes contact with us as if our existence means something to Him personally. Verse 4 again. What is man that you are mindful of him, and the son of man that you visit him? For you have made him a little lower than the angels, and you have crowned him with glory and honor. It's a meaningful humanity with a God-given place in this universe. So according to this, the human race is supposed to be here on a planet designed specifically to be our home. And again, you might not be ready to say the Bible is an authoritative source of knowledge, but you've got to admit this. There's got to be some reason we're staring into the sky. 3,000 years ago, a shepherd poet took a look up there, and that was at a time when you could only see 5,000 stars with the naked eye. We had no idea how big it really was. And he looked into the night sky and he felt two conflicting emotions, just like you do. On the one hand, he, he's small and insignificant, but at the same time, he senses that you and I are important to somebody out there, and we were put here on purpose. Are you searching for answers to life's toughest questions like, where is God when we suffer? Can I find real happiness? Or is there any hope for our chaotic world? The Discover Bible Guides will help you find the answers you're looking for. Visit us at BibleStudies.com or give us a call at 888-456-7933 for your free Discover Bible Guides. Study online 
on our secure website or have the free guides mailed right to your home. There is never a cost or obligation. The Discover Bible Guides are our free gift to you. Find answers and guides like, Does My Life Really Matter to God? and A Second Chance at Life. You'll find answers to the things that matter most to you in each of the 26 Discover Bible Guides. Visit BibleStudies.com and begin your journey today to discover answers to life's deepest questions. A lot of years have gone by now since I lived up there on the Alaska Highway, and there are things I don't miss, I'll tell you that. I, I don't miss, you know, 10 months of shoveling the snow. I don't miss having to plug in the block heater and having square tires as you drive the first two miles because it's 50 below outside. There are parts I don't miss, but I'll tell you what I do miss. I mean, the sky was crystal clear in those parts. There were no lights around, no pollution. There was nothing there to get in the way of your view of the night sky. And when those northern lights came out, I'm telling you, it's worth it to lay there in 40 below just for that stirring in your heart, just for that sense of awe that I'm convinced God has put in every heart so that we discover Him. So let me give you this challenge. I know it's not possible these days. We all live in urban centers, more and more of us all the time, but... If you could find just a few minutes to get out of the light pollution of your city, there are actually dark places across this continent, designated dark places, where you can go and look up at the sky for just a few hours. I think you're going to find something remarkable. You're going to have the very same feelings that the poet was trying to describe in the book of Psalms. So the question I want you to contemplate is this. Where in the world did those emotions come from? Why would an accident of the universe, something that just erupted from the Big Bang, why would that suddenly hope that they are not an accident? Why would they suddenly hope that someone out there knows that they're here? Why would it matter to us whether or not we're alone? You know how Viktor Frankl saved lives in a Nazi death camp? That's what he's famous for. Here's what he did. He reminded people that there's something else outside of yourself, something out there in the universe that makes life worth clinging to. And when we realize that, that somebody loves us, somebody designed us, somebody put us on here on purpose for a reason, life is worth living. I'm Sean Boonstra. This has been Authentic. Thank you.